Ecclesiastes, which deal with problems of providence. And I don't want to say this is speculative wisdom. It's more theoretical in a sense, but I don't want to call it speculative because there's nothing in the Bible like speculative Greek philosophy. Let me go ahead and pull that up a little bit. In other words, the Greeks developed an elaborate system of speculative philosophy. You don't find that in the Bible. What you find is you find people wrestling with the fact that the world doesn't seem to line up with our theological understanding of how the world ought to work. For example, in Job, a righteous man is suffering. Why do people suffer? Well, one idea is that people suffer because, because God is righteous and therefore they're wicked and they're being punished. And it's quite true that, that uh, God does uh, punish people. And in fact, sometimes uh, suffering in this life can be the result of sin either your sin or someone else's sin. That's very clear. But that doesn't exhaust the possibilities. And it didn't happen, uh, it wasn't the case in, jo in the case of Job. Job was a righteous man, and we know that from the beginning. It said, it said in, in, in chapter 1 that he feared God and he eschewed or avoided evil. And so he was a righteous man. So why is he suffering? And I think a wonderful chapter in the book that sort of gives us a hint into what's going on is in chapter 28. Some people, uh, I think the, the majority view has been to take those as the words of, uh, of Job. There is a view that suggests that that's the narrator. And um, I, I don't want to take sides on that issue at this point. I think there, there are good arguments to be made that it is Job. Um, uh, I think there's some arguments to be made that it's the narrator. But, but there, it's more philosophical, it's more theoretical, it's more general and theological, chapter 28. And um, I'm not going to read it for time's sake, but essentially chapter 28 is about how man is so ingenious and can do almost anything. He can tunnel into the mountains, he can climb, he, he can push back the sea, he can climb to the top of the highest mountain where eagles don't even soar. Um, he can do all these things, but he can't find wisdom. And even if he could find wisdom, he couldn't buy it. <laughs> he, he, he doesn't have the resources to buy it. And um, no matter where he searches, he can't find it. And then it comes to the end and says, the Lord has wisdom. See, the wisdom is bound up in God and his creation and, and his purposes. And the kind of wisdom that's being talked about there is inscrutable. You can't, you can't find it out because God has hidden it. Uh, it's too far above us. And of course, that's the whole point when God comes to Job and he quizzes him about, do you understand how I do things and why I do things? Not only in the natural realm, but how I also humble the, the sons of pride. And um, so it's also, I think, an issue of his ethical governance of the universe. And of course, Job's only answer is, I don't know anything. You're, you're wise. I'm not wise. I don't know anything. But, but if you get, when you get to the end of chapter 28, to go back there, it says, to man, God says, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. And so the point is, the point is the Job and Ecclesiastes as well uh, teach us that some of those things, the big why questions that we want to know the answers to, we don't know. There's some things we just don't know, but we can fear God in a practical sense. We can, we, can, we can have wisdom in the sense of the fear of God, the trust of God, and the avoidance of evil. And I think you see that as the conclusion, right, in both books, uh, both the book of Job and the book of Ecclesiastes, where the conclusion of the matter is fear God, avoid evil in the case of Job, or fear God and keep his commandments, which are really equivalent to the same thing. They're, 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 they're essentially equivalents. And so I think, again, the wisdom literature is a great expression of the truth that God's teaching through his covenant with Israel, but it's personalized. In the case of wisdom literature, it's very much individualized, and it's, and it's universalized in the sense that these truths can apply to anyone who's a God-fearing person, whether they're under the covenant uh, uh, with, uh, as, uh, as a nation or not. An Israelite or a non-Israelite can take these principles and apply them very much directly uh, to his own life in many ways. So I think that that's probably a good way we can look at the wisdom literature, and I probably have to leave it at that or we'll never get through the other material uh, that we have for the rest of the class. Uh, and so I guess at this point, it might be well to ask if you have any 
if you have any questions. <clears throat> really no, maybe a question, um, but one comment by uh, Dr. P Peterson, based on the parallels and fearing God and avoiding evil, I like to think of fear as faith. It is invisible as faith is invisible, but evidenced in external. Any comment on that? Yeah, I, I really think that that's very, very strong because um, what, what is, you know, what is faith anyway? I really like the word trust, right? Mm -hmm. Faith obviously includes a, um, it has to include an intellectual assent. It has to include agreement and belief intellectually speaking or mentally speaking, but there's much more to faith than that. It's a sense of personal trust. Well, trust and submission go together. You can't trust if you're not submitting. Uh, to me, a great illustration is when you go to the doctor and the doctor says, I can cure you of whatever you have. You're very sick, but I, I, know, I, I know I have a cure for you. He, and, and, and so, okay, I'm going to operate. And so you have to submit to the doctor's instructions and, and go under the knife. So there's a trusting submission aspect. But he might also require you to do things, right? He might say, look, you have to take this medicine. And when you take it, you have to take all of it. Don't just take it till you start feeling better, you know, take it all and then don't do this and do that. And people who trust their doctor submit to his instructions. <laughs> and so I really think that there is a very, there's strong parallel there. Genuine trust produces obedience, right? And genuine trust is parallel with submission. And so if you're not submissive, it's hard to say, it's hard to really claim with credibility that you're trusting. And so, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that very much. Sounds great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Shall we move over then to the next set of materials? Yes. That'd be great. Okay. Let me do that. I should have those up and be able to share those. Give me a second here. We've sent a link out. So uh, we should be able to get those through Dropbox if, I, if you haven't downloaded those yet. Okay. Uh, now, why can't I find it? Oh, there it is. Okay. Great. Is that coming up? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, again, I want to do the same kind of an approach here uh, as I did last time, which is start with the historical books and then move, uh, uh, move into the supplementary books. In the case of the United Monarchy, uh, the, 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 obviously, the and before, the key books, the historical books, were Joshua essentially through Samuel, and then the supplementary books were the, uh, were the uh, Psalms and the wisdom literature. Uh, the same kind of thing we're doing here. The, the key historical books are kings in the case of the pre-exilic uh, material, roughly speaking, and then chronicles in the post-exilic material, as well as Ezra and Nehemiah, and I'm including Daniel in that, although Daniel is mixed with prophecy. And then the, the, um, the uh, other side, the other books are basically the prophetic literature, right? You can include uh, lamentations there as well, but basically the, um, the, uh, the prophetic literature. And, and I'm doing it by dividing into two periods, okay? Uh, just like uh, we kind of had two periods, what, what we had the leading up to the monarchy and then the monarchy, but I've got this divided into two periods. So I've got the monarchy after David to the point of the exile, essentially. And so that covers kings and then also the pre-exilic uh, prophetic books. And then I've got uh, what essentially is chronicles and then those other historical books uh, and then the post-exilic books. Um, so that's the way we're going to look at it. So let's start here with kings. Uh, um, kings is fascinating um, and uh, I think it really does carry forward these themes, right? Remember, we talked about this kind of contrast. We have the faithfulness of God to the covenant, the faithfulness of God to his word and to the covenant. And, and then we have the unfaithfulness of Israel. And there is this kind of interaction as there is a kind of a back and forth as God is continually dealing with Israel. And we see the same thing here in Kings. Um, although I would say that, the um, um, I, I would say that in a sense the 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 direction is a little bit reversed. What do I mean by that? Well, um, in 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 Judges, it's interesting, kind of the, the the sine wave or the cycle you see. In Judges, you see that God in, in Joshua, God is faithful to give Israel the land, right? 
And then Israel in Judges is unfaithful, and God is dealing with Israel's rebellion. And God is acting in faithfulness, but he's also acting in chastisement and punishment. And then you get hope coming out of, like, say, the book of Ruth. And so you have this sort of upturn. And then that upturn or that, that hope continues in um, Samuel, and you see God's deliverance of Israel in Samuel, even though Israel's still unfaithful. So the contrast between God's faithfulness and Israel's unfaithfulness is constantly uh, operating. But the different aspects or the different prospects for Israel are, are, are brought to the fore as you go through the books. And you, you end on a high note in Samuel, right? You end, end with David restored to the monarchy. Even though David failed, God was faithful to, to discipline him. Um, and, uh, and then also he was faithful to, um, to restore him to the throne. And uh, things are looking up. Right, we have the Davidic, uh, we have the Davidic covenant, the promise that David will not lack for a son to sit on the throne, and so you have this wonderful feeling of optimism as you get to the end of First Samuel. Although there's always sort of this, sort of uh, uh, if you can think about it, there's there's kind of an undertone uh, in a minor key because you're seeing that Israel is really prone to failure, and so you're never quite fully confident in the outcome, but uh, nevertheless. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, you, you, there's, it's very optimistic. Well, you start out the book of Kings then on a very optimistic note, don't you? Notice the context. There's the Davidic king, kingship. You get to the end of David's life, and um, you get to the end of David's life, and there's the Davidic covenant, and then you have the example of Yahweh's faithfulness to Israel and to David. How does that? Well, God has been faithful to Israel, by keeping David, by not allowing David's kingdom to fail. And the beginning of the book of Kings is God's faithfulness to his promises to the house of David, in that he puts Solomon on the throne. There's a threat already from Adonijah, but God, um, God uh, is faithful, and that, that threat is thwarted, and, and Solomon sits on the throne, and his kingdom is established. And it's very important that's actually specifically stated, that Solomon's kingdom is established, and, uh, and then we see Solomon's great wisdom, right? So now we have not only, not only do we have the fact that David's son is sitting on the throne, but he's, a, he's the wisest king that had ever been. And uh, so it, things are looking up in a great way. But of course, as you know, the whole thing crashes and burns because Solomon, in his wisdom, this is the irony, Solomon, in, in marrying all of these princesses and all of these um, uh, women from pagan religions was doing what was considered wise at the time in that he was building up his kingdom by forming alliances. And so, but in the use of his human wisdom, uh, he ended up violating the commandment and the charge that he had been given by, the, by his father and by the Lord who appeared to him and said, if you walk in my statutes, I will bless you. But if you don't, I will curse you. And, and so here's Solomon putting his wisdom above God's word, and the whole thing starts to come down. So God, in his mercy, disciplines Solomon, right? He promised he would discipline. This is in keeping with the, with the Davidic covenant. He says, if your son disobeys me, I will discipline him, but I will not utterly cast him off. And so he disciplines Solomon, Right, he he takes he takes the he takes the ten tribes away and leaves them with Judah and Benjamin along with Judah, and uh, gives the the northern kingdom to Jeroboam, and then of course as you know Jeroboam introduces the golden calves, the same idolatry that Israel practiced in in Egypt, and um, and uh, and the whole apostasy starts, and the whole book of Kings then is about this apostasy. And, uh, and the, what are the consequences of this apostasy? So the, the, the strong emphasis in Kings then is on, just from lo looking over the general course of the book, we could say it is the apostasy of Israel. Now, I'd like to do something here. I'd like to just look at some vocabulary. Um, we have some powerful tools, of course, and so I just used Bible works and did a word list out of Kings and then took out, you know, words like and and the, and other other things like that did the did the did the words the study the word list was in Hebrew, and just to see what I could find. Now there need to be some cautions here. James Barr pointed out in his classic work Semantics of Biblical Language, you don't derive your theology from words, 
Words themselves don't give you the theology uh, of the Bible. Uh, words are used to properly, in the context, interpret sentences. So I need to know word meanings or the range of possible word meanings to properly interpret in, in the word in its context. And I put all the words together into theological sentences, and it's those theological uh, sentences um, um, that are um, important for, um, for discerning theology. So um, uh, Barr's work was kind of famous for that. He was critical of the idea that we can derive our theology just from the meaning of words. Now, just a note, uh, Barr was not a conservative person. And so um, I, I'm not, obviously in many of these sources, we don't recommend people for the theology, uh, but, but I think his point was correct on that, that it's the theology comes from the sentences, uh, comes from the statements made right? Not just, not mainly from word definitions. Uh, second point is the frequency of a term in a book by itself does not necessarily mean that that is the most important theme in the book. A word could occur many times for various reasons, especially a word I was thinking about here in Kings, and I don't have it here, but the word house occurs many times. And, and, and what you have to do is you have to actually take that word house and then look at its uses throughout its many hundred, more than a hundred uses, hundreds of uses. You have to look at it because you could be talking about the house of David, which means a dynasty, or you could be talking about the house of God, right, which refers to the temple, or you could be talking about someone's house, in which case it's not necessarily theological at all. So uh, this is a rather crude measure. So I'm not saying that these words, uh, frequencies, I'm giving some cautions here, but I did think it was instructive at least as a suggestive or say suggestive that, that some of these word groupings. So apart from Yahweh, which occurs 534 times and God or gods, it's Elohim. So it's either being used of the true God or of the false gods, plural, um, uh, occurs 206 times. And of course, those words are very common throughout the Old Testament because the book is about the Lord. But it is interesting to me that the word king occurs 833 times. It's no wonder this was called the book of the kings, right? Uh, Solomon 162 times, David 98 times, Jeroboam 79 times, Ahab 76 times, Jehoshaphat 37 times. And I made a mistake there with Hezekiah. I think it's like 36 or 30, 35 or 36 times. I, I forgot. I made a typo there. But around around 35 or 36 times. So um, obviously king the kingship is fundamental here to the book. And I think you could get that probably from just reading it, uh, the idea of the kingship. Also, you notice there's an emphasis on the northern kingdom, right? You have Jeroboam and Ahab. You also have Jehoshaphat and Hezekiah. And there is kind of a contrast between the wicked kings of the north and, the, uh, and some of the kings in the south who were good, right? And it's interesting. You have two of the worst characters, Jeroboam, who got the whole thing started, and who is repeatedly mentioned as the one who caused Israel to sin. And then Ahab, of course, who made things worse by actually worshiping Baal, marrying a, a Phoenician princess and, and worshiping Baal. And then you have Jehoshaphat, of course, one of the good kings of the south, and Hezekiah, one of the good kings of the south. Well, and then there are also many words related to the nation. Israel occurs 367 times, Judah 137 times, Jerusalem land 127, Jerusalem 92 times, Samaria 68 times. There are also a uh, significant emphasis on the prophet in these books, not as much as on the kings, you can see. It's, it's much less than on the kings. But the term prophet, uh, Nabiya, uh, uh, occurs uh, 84 times. The word of Yahweh, that phrase, occurs 60 times. The man of God, that phrase, occurs 57 times. Elijah, 62 times. Elisha, 58 times. And so again, what you have is you have these concepts, and then you have significant illustrations of these concepts, right? You have the, 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 the certain of the kings are emphasized um, for, for, for the Lord's purposes of teaching. And then Elijah and Elisha, of course, are emphasized as, as exemplars of the prophetic ministry, especially the prophetic ministry in opposition to the apostasy of the nation and especially the apostasy of the kings. The role of the prophet in Samuel has a lot to do with the rise of the monarchy and the establishment of the monarchy. 
um, the role of the prophet, although there is a warning, certainly, and there is judgment, particularly against Saul and some against Eli, the role of the prophet. But uh, largely it's building up because that's the theme of the book of Samuel, the rise of the kingship, the establishment of the kingship. But in Kings, uh, it's, mu- it's the, 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 most of the role of the prophet in the book of Kings is to rebuke the nation and particularly its leaders for their sin and uh, to pronounce judgment. Now, I do think that in the case of Kings, uh, we have this wonderful passage uh, in terms of wonderful in the sense of, uh, um, wonderful in the sense of, uh, of wonderful theology, of course, terrible and, and awe-inspiring in the sense of its massive judgment that it's pronouncing on Israel. And that's Second Kings 17, five through 23. And uh, so I just want to, as you go through this, I want you just to see a little bit um, that, that this is, in a sense, the summary message of the book of Kings, uh, right? He says, then the king of Assyria came out throughout all the land. Hoshea had rebelled is the context. And it's the captivity of the northern kingdom in 722 or uh, slash 721. Then the king of Assyria came up through all the land and went to Samaria and besieged it three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king uh, of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away to, into Assyria and placed them in Hala and Habor by the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. Uh, he took them far away. And so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt. Notice here this reference to bring them up out of the land of Egypt Um, In other words, it's a violation, again, of the relationship and the covenant that God had made with Israel. I am the Lord your God, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me, the Ten Commandments say. Um, And um, and so uh, the um, it's interesting that that as you looked at that, then the um, the the. uh, the fact is that it's covenant breach. And that's the strong emphasis in the book of Kings is the breach of the covenant by the nation under the leadership of the kings. The, and so it's really the failure of the kingship is very important. It says, and they walked in the statutes of the heathen whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel and the kings of Israel, which he had made, which they had made. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God and they built them high places in all their cities from the tower of the watchmen to the fenced city. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols whereof the Lord had said to them, you shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified, so, uh, well, we'll keep going here. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to the law, which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like the neck of their fathers, that they did not believe in the Lord their God, and they rejected his statutes and his covenant, that he made with their fathers and his testimonies, which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. And they left all the commandments of the Lord, their God and made them molten images, even two calves and made a grove and worshiped all the hosts of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and used divination and enchantments, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger. Therefore the Lord was angry with Israel, and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Also Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel, which they made. And the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel, and afflicted them, and delivered them into the hand of spoilers, until he had cast them out of his sight. For he rent Israel from the house of David and made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. And Jeroboam drave Israel from following the Lord and made them sin a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They departed not from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight. As he had said by all his servants, the prophets, so was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. 
So obviously this is massively important theologically for understanding the book. In fact, it's a summary of the book. Now you have later chapters that are going to deal with Israel and what happens to Israel. I mean, uh, Judah, sorry, Judah and what happens to Judah. But it's quite clear that, that this is the fundamental sort of message of the book. And so what do we see here? Well, we see, first of all, the sin of Israel, right? They, 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 they committed a violation of the covenant and of the commandments in their unauthorized worship in both place and manner. They set up high places. And also they worshiped uh, through the use of idols or golden uh, images, golden calves, etc. It said they adopted the practices of the nations against the Lord's commandment. And of course, these are all things God commanded them not to do specifically. God called them to repentance. And so the emphasis on the prophecies or the prophets through his prophets. And so we have the concept of the man of God, also the word of Yahweh and the Elijah and the Elisha accounts. Um, it's interesting, this emphasis on the word of Yahweh is fascinating. There are a number of places there where God is specifically establishing that the word of Yahweh always comes to pass, whether it's a word of judgment or a word of blessing. And you do well to heed the word of Yahweh. I remember one of the, one of the first stories has to do with the prophet who went and prophesied against the altar of Jeroboam. And, on, and God had told him not to talk to anybody, not to go, not to stay, not to go in and eat with anyone, um, or, or not to tarry. And of course, this other prophet had lied to him, and he disobeyed the word of the Lord, and a lion killed him. And uh, it, it, God is establishing that you don't disobey his word and get away with it. And uh, a very important a principle that it occurs over and over and over again uh, in the book of Kings. Also, there is this emphasis here on God's diligence and patience, right? He repeatedly sent prophets. He sent them for hundreds of years. God was very patient with Israel. He wasn't, he, he didn't have a hair trigger, we could say. He, he didn't, um, we should say he, he wasn't, he wasn't um, just ready to strike them down at the first moment of disobedience. He called them repeatedly to repentance, but Israel refused to listen. They were stubborn. They hardened their necks. Like you can imagine a stubborn ox or a stubborn horse who, who hardens his neck and pushes his neck the other way and refuses to submit to the yoke. They stubbornly refused to hear. They rejected the commandments like their fathers did. They adopted worse pagan practices. Uh, and uh, there was this declining uh, going on. And then God's judgment. He was angry with Israel. He rejected the descendants of Israel. He gave them into the hands of spoilers. He drove them out of his sight. He cut Israel off from the house of David. He judged Israel by means of the sins of Jeroboam. So obviously you have the summary of what's going on. And I think it's quite clear that this is the theological message of Kings. What started out on such a high note at the end of the book of Samuel, and even, even part of the way through the book of Kings, the first part where, um, where Solomon is established in his kingdom, very quickly goes bad. And it's quite clear that as it was then constituted, the, the kingship was not going to save Israel. In fact, it ended up being um, uh, a failure. And that's an important concept, an important uh, thing to understand about this part of the, uh, of the Old Testament. Now, quickly, um, I want to see uh, in terms of time. We have, um, uh, should we take a break now or you want to go just a few more minutes? You know, I'm, I'm actually good if you just want to keep going, you know, just however you are as far as us. Okay, I'm feeling good. Yeah, I want to get through this, this part of Kings, and then we can take a break. How about that? Sure. Um, okay, the key theological backdrop is the Mosaic Covenant. And I don't have time to draw out all of these parallels, but if you look particularly at passages like Leviticus 26, 1 through 43 and Deuteronomy 28, God had told Israel both in Leviticus at Mount Sinai and also at De in Deuteronomy in the plains of Moab 40 years or 40 years later, he told them this would happen. This is a fulfillment of what God had said. He said, if you walk in my ways and keep my covenant, I will bless you. But if you don't, if you adopt the practices of the people that you're, you're supposed to drive out, if you, if you worship uh, uh, idols, if you worship other gods, if you, uh, if you do these other wicked things, I will 
punish you and he talks about how I will curse you and there's long section of cursing until I, he eventually says, I will eventually drive you away from my presence. I will drive you out of the land. And, and you look at the book of Kings and so many of those individual prophecies are fulfilled down to the people in the straightness of the siege, killing their own children and eating them. It's a, it's a horrific picture. But God is saying, it's again, this concept of the fear of, of the Lord. It includes actual fright. He says, he says, don't you dare, don't you dare violate my covenant. There are huge consequences for violating my covenant. And you see those fulfilled in the book of Kings. And it should strike fear, frankly. Now, I realize that we, are, uh, we have this forgiveness in Christ. And, and so we, we need to be careful. We don't make these kind of direct application of these Old Testament uh, kingdom um, uh, blessings and curses in the Mosaic Covenant and try to apply them directly to the Christian. I think that that's a big mistake. Part of what God was doing in the Old Testament was showing Israel the consequences of sin. But I, I do think that even as Christians, we should see how God views sin. God hates sin. God abhors sin. God judges sin. We should never minimize the judgment of God. And, of course, we realize that God poured that judgment out on Jesus Christ. And, and that full hatred and that full wrath was poured out on our Savior. And God hates our sin every bit as much as he hates the sin of Israel. The fact is that we have this forgiveness, so we should be all the more thankful for the forgiveness that God has given us, seeing the hatred, the, the visceral um, uh, hatred that God has towards sin. Sin is horrible. And I think one of the biggest problems we have in our lives is because we're used to being sinful and we're used to living in a sinful society, even we as Christians take sin lightly. And, and, and the book of Kings and uh, these passages in the Pentateuch that talk about this, I think that's a powerful antidote to taking sin lightly. Uh, sin is never a small matter. We should, never have, we should have a zero tolerance policy towards sin in our lives. We should always deal with it whenever it shows up and ask forgiveness, etc. So it, it's quite a powerful message there. Also, though, there was this faithfulness. You see an undercurrent here that despite the faithlessness of the kingship, the failure of the kingship, that God is faithful to preserve the Davidic line. We see that a couple times in the time of Rehoboam. Um, uh, God preserves to Rehoboam one tribe, he says. It includes Benjamin, so we would say two tribes. But uh, the tribe of Judah is reserved to Rehoboam because he promised he wouldn't totally cast off. The Davidic kingship continues. In the time of Athaliah, the, 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 the Davidic line almost was cut off. It was one person away from being completely cut off, and yet God in his mercy and providence preserved it. And then in the time of captivity, Kings, Kings actually ends on a positive note. Jehoiachin in, in captivity is by, uh, 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 by the king of Babylon is elevated again and given some comfort and given a place of honor even after he had been taken captive and been in prison. And there is this sort of like a reminder that God is still faithful to preserve and keep his promises. And uh, even though Israel is unfaithful, and that's the emphasis and the fact that they violated the covenant and broke it, and God judged them according to the terms of the covenant, nevertheless, there is this undercurrent of God's faithfulness and that will somehow overcome Israel's rebellion and sin and bring about the result of God's promises that he made. So, so that essentially takes us through the end of Kings. Then the next part will be on, on the prophets, and then we'll get into the post-exilic material. But it might be a good time uh, either for questions or for a break, or a break and then questions, however you'd like to do that. Well, if we take a break, can we just take a real short one? We kind of got a little sure. bit of late, right? so I'd love to get as much uh, in, info in as possible. Well, I, I, I'd be happy to just uh, like a stand-up <clears throat> stretch break. <laughs> that like sounds great. Minutes. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Okay. okay, let's do that. Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> 
Hey, that was good timing. Okay, great, great. Glad to be back. Um, let's get now into the prophets because obviously the prophetic material is needs to be read in light of, uh, in conjunction with the historical material. It's uh, the historical material gives the context, and then the prophetic material, in a sense, gives more explanation, and also. So let, let's talk first of all about the uh, the idea of the prophets and talk about this concept of prophet. Uh, I think um, there's a lot more could be said about that. This is just a, a brief uh, aspect of the work of the prophet. But the fundamental responsibility of the prophet was to say what the Lord commanded. And the prophets were not innovators. They were not uh, creative individuals. Their job was to faithfully say what God had said. Now, uh, I understand, and, and there's an emphasis here on, on thus saith the Lord, or says Yahweh, right? Or thus says Yahweh. Um, just the second phrase occurs over 500 times in the Old Testament, 450 times in the latter prophets. So there's this phrase, it's a refrain over and over again, thus saith the Lord, right? Says the Lord. Also, there's the phrase, the declaration of Yahweh, over 450 times in the latter prophets. So you have this just incredible uh, re repetition. And the point is that this was not their message, right? We see the word of Yahweh over 230 times, almost 150 times in the latter prophets. Shows the indefeasible authority of the prophetic word. Uh, especially we see that in 1 Kings 13. And that's, that's the one I referenced, if I'm not mistaken. That's the one I referenced about the altar of Jeroboam. Um, I'd have to double check on that, but I believe that's the case. I know someone wants to take a quick look at that. Um, and, and the idea is it, it's sort of like the, uh, the initial introduction to the prophets in the book of Kings. And, and the word of the Lord never fails. Right? And so the, the main responsibility of the prophet was to say what God said. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, what was the nature of the prophetic message? Well, it was basically preaching. And I think this is important. There's a lot of forth telling I'm sorry, there's a lot of foretelling in the prophets, meaning they, they prophesy of the future. And that's very important to consider that. There's a tendency that we have to treat that as the most important thing in the prophecy. But uh, the, the, the foretelling is uh, very important, and uh, we don't want to minimize that. But in fact, it, it, it also serves the purpose of preaching or foretelling. The prophets were basically preachers, and I think that's a good way to think of that. God was looking to persuade Israel to repent, to change their ways, and uh, the prophets were the means or the mouthpiece through which he communicated his word to them to accomplish that. So the material is very, as we'd say, hortatory. It's very much exhortation, right? There is the threat of punishment. There is the promise of deliverance. Uh, there is a, There are appeals. There are illustrations, I think, of Hosea and his marriage. And, and God is doing, it's almost like God is pulling out all the stops, we say, or he's, he is engaging in every possible method he can think of to bring Israel back to himself. He'll have Ezekiel lie on one side for many days and then lie on another side for many days and, 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 and eat a bread of affliction and measure. I mean, he's doing all of this through the prophets to try to get the attention of his people. It's, it's, it's amazing if you think about it, the effort, if we can put it that way, the effort that God puts into calling his people back to himself. If you really think about it, it's an incredible enterprise, the prophetic enterprise. Uh, over all these many years that God, these centuries that God is doing this, uh, it really shows an incredible diligence, an incredible faithfulness, a persistence, um, et cetera. Now, they address themselves to the emotions and to the wills of the people. Application was all important. The real issue was application. And so therefore, it's closely tied to the history. And so understanding the historical and cultural situation is crucial. I've asked students this question. I said, what is it that makes the prophets, and particularly asked this with regard to minor prophets, but it applies to the major prophets as well. What makes it so hard for us to understand what's going on in some of these passages of the prophets? And the answer is because they were such effective preachers. And what I mean by that is preaching always occurs in a context, right? If I'm going to reach my audience, my hearers, I've got to address them where they live. I have to be specific. I have to be applicational. 
I have to use illustrations that make sense to them and that touch their hearts. Well, if you're in that context and in that audience, the preaching makes perfect sense to you. There's nothing obscure, difficult about it. It's very powerful. It's very pointed. And if you reject it, it's because you don't want to know it. It's not because you, don't, you can't understand it. But imagine now you're coming from 500 years or 1,000 years or 2,000 years in the future. Or imagine you're coming from some other culture and some other place. And so all these cities that are mentioned that are receiving the judgment of, of God and have received the judgment of God, you don't know what they are. You, they're just names to you. And allusions to customs, you don't know what's being talked about. And even if you can understand the words, you don't have a vivid picture in mind of what's being critiqued or rebuked. And so the trouble we have in interpreting the prophets is because they were such good preachers. And, and what that means, though, is if we really study and dig and understand the context, then the messages just, they, they just come alive uh, for us. It becomes a situation where we really get the impact of it because they're powerful, powerful messages. What we have to do is get into the context. And, of course, this is not a class in hermeneutics or preaching and so um, interpretation. So we don't have time to really go do that. But I, I just want to encourage you that the thing that makes it difficult for your people to understand the, the Old Testament prophetic books are the very thing, if they're properly explained and applied and brought forward into our day through a proper uh, hermeneutic and a proper theological application, are like super powerful in their uh, in their lives. And I think that, that should encourage us in, when we preach the prophetic uh, material. Uh, predictive prophecy is important, but it must not be divorced from the present response. When God told Israel something about the future, he also wanted that to impact them in the present. That's powerful for us because we're not, we're not looking at eschatology um, just as an academic enterprise. There, there should be a present response to what God is saying to us about what he's going to do in the future. And again, this goes back to the idea of faith. Uh, I think Dr. Peterson brought up. In other words, God wants us to have a present response of faith and therefore of submission to him when he tells us something, whether it's something that's, that's uh, involved in our situation right now, whether it's something that's imminent uh, or whether it's something that's long in the future, right? He wants us to have a present response to him. So again, this idea of, of relationship and response comes back into play when we look at the prophetic material. Now, what about the methodology or the methods of the prophets? Well, um, uh, how did the prophet receive the message? Many times it's not stated. Sometimes the prophet is expressing himself under inspiration. For example, the prayers of Habakkuk when he's praying to God. That's clearly the heart of Habakkuk, but God is inspiring that. But many, many times, and probably the majority of times, you have this idea that the Lord is speaking directly either to the prophet or through the prophet. Uh, so you have the idea of the word of the Lord. You have the idea of the prophet how may have a vision or a dream. So there are these different methods, but in, in every case, it's the word of Yahweh that's, that's at issue. Now, the giving of the message, whether it was a proclamation, it was oral, but sometimes it was in writing. We see that. Um, even in the prophets themselves, sometimes like it says that Jeremiah wrote these letters and sent them to people. Ezekiel wrote letters. So you see even the writing, even inside the books. And of course, all this was eventually written down as well in the writing prophets. They use prediction. They use symbolical action. Um, and again, I think you want to think of the, these men as preachers, right? Uh, when you're preaching, you want to use a variety of things to reach your, to reach your congregation. And so that's what these men were doing as well uh, under the inspiration of the Lord. And what was the goal? Well, it was repentance and reformation, not revolution. It was an urging of conformity to the Mosaic law, right? So remember that this is in the context of, uh, of Israel under the covenant uh, of Sinai. And therefore, uh, God is continually appealing to them to go back to and be obedient to the covenant. Now, obviously, it's more than just an external obedience. There's much emphasis in the prophets on the heart. And there are passages in the prophets where, where the prophets seem to be criticizing the sacrifices. But what they're really doing is they're criticizing the, the, the sort of rote, uh, going through the motions aspect of the sacrifices without the real heart and without a life that reflected it. So it would be hypocritical worship is what they're opposed to. They're not opposed to worship, 
but they're opposed to hypocritical and lifeless uh, worship. Um, but they're calling the wicked. They, they urge faithfulness to the covenant. They urge repentance on the part of the wicked. They urge faithfulness on the part of the righteous. Um, therefore, the Pentateuch and especially Deuteronomy are crucial historical for our historical understanding. And I think a great illustration of this is Elijah on Mount Carmel. And again, in order to get through this, I will not actually turn to the passages. I'll just kind of describe it and let you, let you kind of pursue it in your own studies. But obviously, we have the contest with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And you remember the context of that is Elijah just, it just blasts onto the scene. And he says, there's not going to be any rain except at my word. And then he disappears. And, God, and while the drought is, is taking place and the famine is occurring, God is protecting him by the brook. And then he's got him up in Zarephath, which happens to be right between Tyre and Sidon. In other words, it's right in enemy territory because that's where Jezebel's from. But God is sustaining him through the widow, and God is building his faith and teaching her, and there's all kinds of wonderful lessons of faith in those accounts. But in the meantime, of course, the famine is getting worse and worse in the land, and then Elijah comes back, confronts King Ahab. They're on Mount Carmel, and you know the, uh, you know the story uh, of, how, uh, uh, of how the prophets of Baal try to bring down fire and cannot, and then Elijah prays, and God sends fire, and, the, and, and then, um, then the rain comes. Well, you have to understand that in context. All of that, all of that has a Pentateuchal context. The first, pa the first passage is in Deuteronomy 11, where God tells Israel that um, the land of Canaan is not like the land of Egypt. In Egypt, they would water the land with their foot, literally. And the idea is that they would, they would use, and there, there were methods of irrigation. They would take river water and they would use it to irrigate the land. He's referring to a particular method of irrigation, whether it was using a device you'd use with your foot to, to power irrigation or whether it meant pushing, uh, you know, uh, pushing the, the, little, the little rivulets of water around with your foot. I'm not sure exactly the illusion, but the point was that you use the river. The river was central to, in Egypt to irrigation, uh, to, to crop uh, production. But in Canaan, you depended on the rain. And God said, the land of Canaan is different. He says, the eye of the Lord is over the land or is on the land. God takes special care of the land of Canaan, and he has to send the rain. And so God is sending the rain and the former rain in order for the crop to grow and the, the latter rain in order for the crop to ripen. And if the rain doesn't come when it's supposed to, you have famine. And every year you're depending on the rain. One thing that's wonderful about being farmers, and I, I've never been farmers, but we lived in the country and we're close to farmers and people in our family in years past were farmers. Farmers have to depend on God. <laughs> you can work as hard as you want to work, but you can't, you can't make a crop grow. You have to depend on God. Uh, and and there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of faith involved in farming. But so God says, okay, now if you are obedient to me, I'll send the rain. But if you are not obedient to me, if you worship false gods, if you violate my covenant, I will discipline you by making the heavens brass. I mean, there's, going to be, there's not going to be any rain coming from the heavens. Um, and, and you're going to have famine. And so repeatedly in the Bible, in, in the historical books, you have this idea of famine. Even in the book of Ruth, it, it, there's a famine. And that's important theologically. That's not just a statement of economic conditions. That's important theologically. What that means is God is displeased with his people. They've been breaking the covenant. And um, a tremendous passage is in 2 Chronicles 6 and 7 when Solomon is praying at the temple. And one of the things he prays is, is if your people break your covenant, if your people are disobedient in sin, and you withhold the rain, if they humble themselves and re repent and pray toward this house, please send the rain. It's his prayer that God would listen to the prayers of people offered at, toward the temple or at the temple. And again, there is this idea of repentance bringing rain and, and repentance of, of particularly of idolatry and of worshiping false gods. Because again, it's in the context of covenant breach. It's not just any sin. It's breaking <clears throat> of the covenant. And God used, God used that. So all of that is context for Elijah at Mount Carmel. 
And so that's an example of how it's very important to understand these theological concepts that lead up to the work of the prophets, whether it be the, the former prophets, uh, the non-writing prophets, Elijah and Elisha principally, or whether it be the writing prophets. You have to have this theological background, but that's a very important concept. And again, it's God's covenant discipline that's in view here. Now, what's the basic content of the message of the prophets? Well, there's a great variety, but there are two emphases that predominate. One is imminent judgment on, based on sin. In other words, because of the sin of Israel, judgment is imminent. Imminent doesn't mean that judgment falls today or even tomorrow, but it means it could fall at any moment. And there is this emphasis on the fact that God is bringing judgment. Um, uh, and uh, sometimes the grammar bears that out in the sense that you have this idea that I'm about to do something. I'm about to bring judgment upon Israel, upon the people. Uh, also, there is a judgment on individuals, but particularly officials and false prophets, the leaders. And of course, that fits in very well with the book of Kings, because it's the kings who brought in, who are representing the nation, and it's their job to keep the nation loyal to Yahweh. Jehovah, and the prophets are supposed to call the people back to Jehovah, but now you have the wicked officials and the kings and leaders and the, the false prophets, and they are drawing people away from God. And so you have specific judgment um, on them. There's also judgment on foreign nations, and it's related to two areas. It's kind of interesting. One is related in a sense to Israel's special status as God's people, when, when Israel's mistreated, then that leads to judgment on nations. When, when those nations mistreat Israel, I think of the book of Obadiah and the doom of Edom, or the, the um, particularly was the mistreatment of Israel. And Edom, of course, being related to Israel through Esau, had a special sort of kinship <clears throat> obligation to be loyal and faithful to Israel, and was it, was the inveterate em enemy of Israel. And so God has special pronouncement of judgment on Edom. But also there are passages where, where there are, there's judgment for crimes committed against humanity. I think particularly in the book of Amos, that there are these, these, uh, these wicked, and it's mostly cruelty. These different nations are cruel in various ways, and they receive the judgment of uh, God. And so God, there is this background. It's not just it's not just the Mosaic Covenant that's involved here with the prophets. You also have this background of God's dealing with the nations that goes all the way back to Genesis. And, and God is not unmindful of the nations. And of course, the book of Jonah is a fascinating, it's, it's, it's almost in a class by itself because it's narrative. Um, it's, not Jonah the, it's not Jonah, the prophecy of Jonah. It is the prophet Jonah and his problems. And... Um, and um, there, there's a lot that can be said, obviously, about Jonah and the importance of that and what's going on with that and its relationship to Israel's mission. Um, uh, and so, but one aspect of the book of Jonah is that Jonah, God's prophet, who is in a sense a representative of God's nation, is the only, is the only um, um, I can say this, the only entity in the book of Jonah that disobeys God is Jonah. <laughs> the, um, you know, the, 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 the sailors repent and, and honor God. The whale, uh, the, the great fish, obeys uh, God. The, uh, the, the castor oil plant or the, the gourd plant or however that's translated, obeys God. The Ninevites repent. Everything and everyone obeys God except for God's people. And I think it's a powerful indictment on the nation of Israel. There are many other things there as well, but but the point is that God is interested in these other nations and he's interested in forgiving them and their repentance as well. And I think that's an important reminder in the book of, of, of uh, Jonah that God is interested in ultimately blessing the other nations. And in fact, many of the, many of the future calls of restoration involve a restoration of these other nations uh, after they are judged. So God is not interested only in Israel or in Israel only for Israel's sake. He's interested in the effect that all this is going to have on the other nations. He has a plan that's, that's worldwide, as we see back going way back to the uh, Abrahamic covenant even, or, and before. Now, there's going to be a future restoration based on the faithfulness and for the glory of the Lord. 
right? The re restoration is never because of Israel. Israel does repent. Israel is called to repent. Is It's predicted and prophesied that Israel will repent. But that's not the basis upon which. That's sort of, in a sense, a condition. But, but the basis is God's faithfulness to his promise to the patriarchs and to David, particularly. And you have this repetition over and over again, that God loved the patriarchs, that he... He loved Israel for the sake of the patriarchs, that he loved David, and that for the sake of his promises to the patriarchs and to David, he was going to bring Israel back to himself. And particularly in the book of Ezekiel, uh, in like chapter 36, God emphasizes, this is not because of you. This is because of my name, because of my promises. Uh, don't get to thinking it's because there's something good about you, because you've broken the covenant. So obviously I mentioned God's vindication of his holy name among the nations, particularly Ezekiel 36 is a very important chapter in that regard. He said, you profane my name. You, you, you violated my covenant. And because you violated my covenant, therefore God is obliged, he says, he's obliged to, to punish them and to judge them and to, um, and to disperse them as a nation. But then he said, you profane my name in all the nations where you went. In other words, when you went into exile, you profane my name. To profane God's name means to treat it as common. In other words, God's name is a great name. God is the sovereign God. God is the only God. And yet, because God dispersed Israel, the temptation on the part of the, of the, of the nations was to say, well, God could not protect Jehovah couldn't protect his people. And, and it made his name common. And he says, so I'm going to bring you back, but not for your sake, but for the sake of my name or my reputation among the nations. And I really think this goes all the way back again to, uh, to Genesis and the Abrahamic promise that, that God wants to make himself known to all the nations for their blessing and also for, of course, for his, his glory. Then there's also this idea of the, um, I mentioned God's, there's God's preservation of the remnant. I think you see that there. In other words, uh, one, one concept, how, how does this work? Um, God is, is doing, is promised that he's going to do these great things in the world. He's going to bless Israel. He's going to use Israel. He's going to bless all nations through Israel. He's going to do all this stuff. And, and then he, in order to fulfill that, he enters a covenant with Israel, which Israel repeatedly breaks. So the question is, if Israel is always if it perpetually failing, how is God going to fulfill his promises? How is he, how, God's plan seems to be falling apart. It's almost like you, you, you have a great a vision for, for some kind of a ministry and you start the ministry, but everybody involved in the ministry is, is, is against it and, and they're fighting against it and they're, they're embezzling funds and they're doing all this. And it's like, how in the world can you possibly fulfill your mission? If the people who are the, going to be implementing it for you or through whom you're going to implement it, if they just won't be faithful to the vision, see? And so that's kind of the idea. So I mentioned in the earlier lecture, the tension between God's unconditional promises and his plans that he's revealing through these covenants and otherwise, on the one hand, and the conditional nature of the, the, the Mosaic covenant, where God says, if you break this covenant, I'm going to disperse you. So the question then is, well, what's going to happen to God's plan? And I think that one of the major issues that's being worked out in the prophetic literature is what, how God is going to deal with that issue. And so what are some of the ways? Well, one way is God's going to vindicate himself and it, for the basis of his holy name. Another one is he's going to preserve a remnant, right? A remainder. He's not going to make a full end of Israel. There's going to be a small group. And there's going to be a generation, a remnant that's left over, and then that remnant is going to repent, and then God's going to bless that remnant. What that does is it allows him to judge the nation as he promised he would without completely casting off the nation. And you see that, uh, frankly, in the book of, in the, in, in, um, in the Pentateuch, particularly in the book of Deuteronomy, he says, and when they're in their, when, what, who's left of Israel, when they are in dispersed throughout the nations, they will then repent, and I will then have mercy. On them. So the concept of the remnant, we see that in Kings where God says to Elijah, I have reserved unto me 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So even though the vast majority of the nation has gone totally in apostasy, there were still a few through whom God could work. So this idea of a remnant uh, becomes very important. Also the idea we mentioned, of course, before the new covenant, 
And, and I think this is more fundamental in a sense, because the problem is God has shown that after Joshua, the people fail and they fail almost immediately. And then it says, well, there's no king in Israel. So now there's a king. Great. And then the kings fail, right? Uh, even the Davidic kingship fails. We find King Ahaz, and, and we'll mention this a little bit later, but King Ahaz in Isaiah chapter 7 refuses to trust God. And God says, oh, house of David, is it a small thing that you weary men? Should you weary my God also? In other words, there's an indictment, not just on Ahaz, but on the whole house of David as a failure. So the house of David is failing. Uh, then the prophets come and they preach. And although they're faithful to the Lord, um, the people don't listen to them. So because of the hardness of the people's hearts, the prophets fail. So the question then is, how is God going to succeed? Well, one important principle is in the future, he has demonstrated through this Mosaic covenant that the people couldn't keep it because their hearts were wrong. Their hearts were not circumcised. And so what he does is he promises the new covenant, well, he will give them new hearts, right? And, he, and so regeneration under the new covenant becomes a very powerful uh, principle through which God is going to fulfill his promises in spite of Israel's failings. Uh, then we have the idea of the Messiah, who is going to be the agent of the restoration of the nation for the fulfillment of, his, of its ultimate purposes. So the kingship fails, but the Messiah is the perfect king. He's the son of David who will fulfill the Davidic covenant and bring Israel back to him. He also is the fulfillment of the, of the uh, Abrahamic covenant because he's going to be a light to the nations. He is the faithful priest. He is the messenger of the covenant. He is the prophet that Moses uh, predicted in Deuteronomy who would be like him. Uh, he's the ultimate fulfillment, and he is the one that's going to ultimately fulfill all these, these, uh, these promises that God has made. We'll mention that a little bit more later as well. Okay, so that's essentially the, an overall overview of the message of the prophets, particularly the pre-exilic prophets. And... Um, what I'd like to do is, um, is what I want to do with the post-exilic period is basically say, um, okay, um, how is this, um, how, do, how does the post-exilic material compare and contrast with the pre-exilic material? Because you have historical material and you also have prophetic material, but it's, it's a different tone after the exile. And I kind of want to bring that out. Uh, as well. And we'll do that in the remainder of the class. But are there any questions at this point regarding the, the material from Kings or the material from uh, from the prophetic books? I know that's a lot of material to try to digest. Yes, thank you so much. It's, it's um, these, these notes are very helpful to be able to follow along too. I don't see anything popping up right now. Um, there's been a little bit of discussion, but nothing that is actual question. Um, okay. Yeah, and, and we can do questions at the end if there are any and all that, and then try to kind of tie all this up. I, we want to have enough detail for it to make have some depth to it, but we also want to see kind of the big picture. And, and again, I want to, I think this idea of the tension between, um, on the one hand, the Lord's promises to do things, right, to, to, to going all the way back to the garden and, and the promise of the seed of the woman, and going through Abraham, and then even going to the pr promises to David on the one hand, and then Israel as a failed and, and instrument, uh, that there's a tremendous kind of tension that's created by that. And it's the resolution of that tension that is sort of the wonder of much of the Old Testament as God shows himself powerful and mighty uh, to use the instruments that he chooses. And it's very humbling because obviously we in of ourselves are no different Right, the church has privileges that Israel didn't have. We have uh, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling all of us, uh, etc. There, we have a, a, a more com a completed revelation. We have the Lord Jesus Christ, but honestly, we're failures too. I mean, individually in our lives, we fail God all the time. And and Paul says, "I know that in me that is in my flesh there dwells no good thing." And I think there are just wonderful principles in the book. In, in the Old Testament books that remind us that of ourselves, we are incapable of doing anything that matters for the Lord. And what we have to do is trust in him and in his faithfulness. Just as Israel had to do as a nation, we have to do the same thing as individuals and also collectively as a church. So uh, I think those wonderful large themes are very, very powerful in terms of, uh, of, of preaching uh, as well and, and convicting to our lives personally. 
uh, as ministers. Uh, a great, great, I just have to say this, a great, great temptation in the ministry is to get to the place you think you can do this. Um, yeah, I, I've got this. I, I've learned, I, I've, I've got all this learning and I've, I've learned how to preach and I can do this. And I think God is constantly having to show us that we can't do it, right? Because without him, without Christ living through me, I am useless uh, to him and even a hindrance to his work. Uh, I, I think it's very humbling to look at the Old Testament that way. Okay, let's look at the exile. Okay, so what happens? Well, we have these, we have Israel going into captivity, and there's a little bit of hope. Jehoiachin is raised up. Uh, the, the line of David has not been completely broken, right? The, the tree has been chopped down, <laughs> but there is a promise in Isaiah that a shoot will come up out of the root of Jesse. In other words, the the, the, the kingship has been chopped off, but the, but the line has not failed, and there's going to be a, a shoot that comes out and becomes a great tree. Um, you know, there's still hope. Even, even in the midst of all this suffering and failure, there is still hope. And uh, now the post-exilic books are different in that now the people have been under the discipline of God, right? What you have is now essentially the remnant. Uh, uh, a large portion of the people were killed uh, uh, in Israel, in Judah, in the siege, in the captivity. It was a horrible, horrible experience. And now, though, there is still a people that God has preserved. We can say even a remnant that God has preserved. And now he is going to reestablish them. And, of course, we have the prophecy in Isaiah of Cyrus that, that the Lord, even though Cyrus doesn't acknowledge the Lord, the Lord is going to raise up Cyrus and he's going to reestablish his own people. God's going to reestablish his people in the land. And so uh, now that they're in the land, the, the, these books are written largely to the people who've come back. It's not completely the case that you wonder, okay, Daniel is being written in exile. Esther is being written in exile probably uh, uh, in terms of, but, but there is this sense in which in either case you're dealing with the remnant. And what, so the, the, the post-exilic books, for the most part, are more optimistic than the pre-exilic books. You have, again, this sort of upsurge of optimism. And I, I want to show that in a little bit here. Um, but notice here, the context is greatly different. The, ex the exilic and post-exilic books are completed from approximately 539 Daniel. I'm just basing that on the fact that it says that Daniel served up until the first year of Darius uh, the Mede. Um, and, and so, um, uh, in terms of, you know, exactly when the book of Daniel was written, obviously I, I think it's written roughly, it's developed and written roughly contemporaneous with Daniel. I think Daniel is the author. So it, it's in terms of exactly when that is, let's just say 539. And then you have uh, circa, and, and I'm just putting some figures here, but 445 or maybe, to, I'm, I'm sorry, I should say 445 to 430, obviously. That's a typo, 435 to 430. And um, that's Malachi, the last book to close the canon. Sometime in that period is Malachi. Now, Israel is a remnant, especially in need of hope, although they still need rebuke and warning. Therefore, the tenor of the post-exilic books is different. There still needs to be warning, but it's not the same kind of emphasis on judgment that you typically have in the pre-exilic books. For example, Chronicles tells the same story as Samuel from the beginning of David's reign, and also the same story as Kings, with the addition of Cyrus's decree of the return. However, there's a difference in focus. There's an emphasis on the continuity of the promise. And I think that you have nine chapters of genealogies in the book of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Chronicles. And then you have other genealogies or other name lists that involve the temple and the Levites, et cetera. And again, I think that the way we should see genealogies is they are a sign of continuity. For the most part, genealogies indicate connection. And, and of course, that's important because many of the promises are based on the idea of physical descent, right? Descendants. And so uh, it's very important to establish the legitimacy of the promises, the continuity of the promises. And I think that idea you look, at, you look at Chronicles, and there is a strong emphasis that, that is being made there through the use of the history that we can claim these promises too. If we will turn to the Lord, despite the failures of our fathers, we can receive the, still receive the blessings and forgiveness of the Lord if we'll just turn to him. And so there is this strong emphasis on repentance, but it, there is an offer of hope. And we see that a little bit 
we see, first of all, there's a focus on the Southern kingdom more than you see in the book of Kings and on the Davidic kingship as legitimate and also on the Davidic covenant. Uh, so, for example, 2 Chronicles 13, 4 through 20, uh, a king Abijah, who's the son of Rehoboam, right? Rehob the, the kingdom has been taken from Rehoboam except for the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. And Abijah then is the son of Rehoboam, and he did evil. We we're told in the book of Kings he did evil. Yet, yet even so, in Chronicles, uh, 2 Chronicles 13, 4 through 20, uh, Jeroboam is attacking Israel, uh, Judah, and Abijah is basically rebukes them because he says, we are the legitimate people of God. We have the, the true worship of God. You are false. You have set up false priests and a false system of worship. We have the true worship of God. Not only that, we are the, you know, we're the line of David. So the promises, the promises are being emphasized here, especially the, the promises, um, the, 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 the covenant promises and the Davidic uh, promises. And then also in the days of Jeho uh, Jehoram, it says that God preserved Israel or Judah because of his love for David. And there are other places you can find that as emphasis, but there, uh, I think it's important to see that's, a, that's an important emphasis in Chronicles. Also, there's an emphasis on God-ordained worship in the temple and its legitimacy and importance. And, and one thing that's interesting about Chronicles is the great detail that Chronicles goes to to talk about the provision for the temple and the, 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 uh, the plan of the temple, the plan for the Levites, the construction of the temple, and, and the role of David in that. Remember, you have David as the, as the, as the recipient of the Davidic covenant, and his son's going to sit on his throne. But one of the key emphasis in Chronicles is it was David's passion and heart and plan and also prophetic duty to plan the temple. The temple worship was organized and planned by David in his role as a prophet of the Lord. And that's emphasized uh, uh, over and over again in the book of Chronicles. You even have whole chapters, multiple chapters devoted to that. And so, again, it's establishing the legitimacy of the temple worship. Well, that makes a lot of sense because one of the big issues, obviously, in the, the returned remnant is they got to build the temple. They've got to rebuild the temple. And so it's very important for them to see what they're doing as important and as legitimate and as central to the covenant that God has made with his people. And so there's a strong emphasis on the temple. There's great detail in the construction of the temple under Solomon, 2 Chronicles 2 through 4. There's the defense of the temple worship from usurpation. Uh, remember, this is the account of Uzziah. When he was lifted up in his heart, he tried to go in and offer incense in the temple, and he was resisted by the priests, and that's why he became a leper. And that's emphasized there. The role of the priest is very important and, and, and dis distinct in the book of Chronicles. Then there is an emphasis on the keeping of the Passover under Hezekiah and Josiah. That's just another example. I tried to pick out some highlights. There's a lot of other places where this, these principles are being emphasized. And so uh, is, there's really no way to, to bring them all out. But these are just some of the highlights. There's a special emphasis on how the Passover was especially kept and what a blessing it was and how it resulted in reform uh, in the nation. And so there's this very strong emphasis on the purity of worship. Um, there's also this emphasis on judgment, repentance, and restoration. And it's designed to encourage the remnant that there's still some hope. For example, uh, Rehoboam, we know it says in Kings, did evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, but it says in 2 Chronicles 12, 1 through 8, that when he humbled himself, himself, it says God brought Shishak, or, or uh, God brought Shishak to, to invade Israel, but that, but that Rehoboam and the elders humbled themselves, and as a result of that, God did not make a full end of them. And so there's this idea, okay, if you humble yourself, God will have mercy on you. You see it in the days of Hezekiah as well. It says that Hezekiah, when he was sick, was healed by the Lord, but he didn't, he didn't repay that kindness. But then he, he, he let the ambassadors from Babylon in on his... Plan. He started trusting Babylon instead of trusting the Lord. And it said, God said, you're going to go into cap. Your sons are going to go into captivity to the Babylonians. But then it said that Hezekiah humbled himself and that God had mercy and didn't bring judgment right away. 
Then there's even Manasseh, and I think this is the most, uh, the most extreme case of all. Manasseh is the one that the, in the book of Kings says that no matter what, even in the great, um, the great revival of Josiah and the fact that Josiah humbled himself and was going to be blessed by the Lord and had this wonderful revival, it says that God still would not relent of his intention to send Israel into captivity, or Judah into captivity because of Manasseh and how wicked Manasseh was. I mean, it's just uniformly dark. And then we get to 2 Chronicles 33, and we find out that Manasseh was, was drawn into captivity personally, and he humbled himself, and God restored him to the throne, and he began instituting reforms. And so if even wicked King Manasseh can find a space for repentance, how much more can the remnant, which has come back into the land, find a space for repentance? So there is this Really strong emphasis in Chronicles on the fact that God is merciful and God re relents of the evil when of, of, the, of the harm, of the punishment, when we humble ourselves before him. And of course, that was the objective of the book. And so the history of, um, of kings is intended, in a sense, to justify and to show that God was just in sending Israel into captivity. It wasn't God's fault. God didn't break the covenant. Israel broke the covenant. And that's very important to remember. And Israel failed. But it's also important in Chronicles to remember that God is going to have mercy on them anyway, if they will turn and repent. And so there's this tremendous, I think, uh, emphasis of hope, even in the midst of the same history, which is a history of failure. So I, I think that there's a lot more you can say about Chronicles, but Chronicles is a wonderful, wonderful book in, in offering hope. It's, I, I, it's like Chronicles emphasizes the theology of the second chance. Chronicles is about the second chance. And I think that's just tremendous because how many times do we go before the Lord and say, Lord, I did it again. All these times I promised I wouldn't do it. And I, last time, and, and I think that times we struggle and say, you know, I, Lord, I don't know how, you, how are you going to forgive me again for that, right? And then we have this kind of d discouragement. And I think God wants us to repent and to be genuinely humble. But in order to encourage that, he also wants to give us hope that he will, in fact, forgive us and receive us back to himself for Christ's sake. So. Wonderful, wonderful principles uh, there. Now, Ezra and Nehemiah, I, I think, again, um, you have some of the same emphases as you have in Chronicles. Uh, Ezra picks up where Chronicles leaves off in terms of the decree of Cyrus. Um, uh, Ezra has sort of two accounts. It has the account of the return under Zerubbabel uh, and uh, um, in, uh, and the rebuilding of the temple and the delay and the difficulty and the finally the rebuilding of the temple. And then it comes down to Ezra's own day and the problems that were faced in Ezra's day. And there is intended to be this kind of a comparison that the problem was not so much the opposition and they were facing opposition. The problem was Israel's own faithfulness to obey God and to trust God. And so Ezra is developing that concept. You also have Nehemiah, and of course, Nehemiah is about the rebuilding of the walls. And I think it's important to understand theologically what's going on with the walls, right? Walls are about separation, right? The purpose of the wall, you can't, and, and, and you can't have a society that's keeping the law unless you have walls. Because you can't control things like commerce. And there is, there is a specific example that where once the walls were rebuilt and the gates were set up, they found out that people were coming in to the gates from outside and they were selling and, and the, to, to Israelites, to the people living in Jerusalem, they were buying and selling on the Sabbath day. And they had the, Nehemiah had the gates shut and, said, and, and drove them away and said, you can't come here and sell on the Sabbath. The point was Israel's covenant was a national covenant. For there to be a national covenant, you need a national society group of people keeping the covenant. And um, Israel can't keep the covenant if they can't maintain a society that's keeping the covenant. And if you can't have a society that's keeping the covenant and maintaining the laws, then how does the Messiah come and perfectly keep the law for us? See, the Lord Jesus Christ not kept every aspect of the law, right? Every jot and every tittle to use his phrase, right? It did not pass away. He fulfilled it all. He was circumcised on the eighth day. That meant that there had to be an active temple where there was active 
worship going on. And his, his, his parents offered, uh, his, his, um, his mother and Joseph, his stepfather, they offered the, um, the sacrifice required of the law. It says specifically that it was what was required of the law in Luke, I believe. And so, but again, if there's no temple, then there's no sacrifices. So you can't offer the sacrifice. If there's no Sabbath keeping, then he can't keep the Sabbath, right? Even as a child, he's got to keep the Sabbath. I mean, and, and so uh, without the rebuilding of the society and the rebuilding of the walls, and at least a society where it's possible to keep the law for someone uh, like Christ who is perfect, right? Uh, if there's no social structure, then there can be no Messiah. And so theologically, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah are massively important for us in understanding uh, our own redemption. And um, the rebuilding of the walls become essential as part of that. Um, so Nehemiah is often preached that when you're having a building program, <laughs> because you, you need to rebuild the walls of your church or something. But I, I think it, it has a theological sense that goes way beyond those kinds of things. Uh, it deals with the issue of, of our mission, right? And, and God, um, uh, the power of God and our, the necessity of us trusting God to fulfill the mission God has given to us. So it's much broader, I think, than those things, uh, just the physical. So a, a tremendous emphasis. The other thing I, the other thing I want to say about this is in both books, there's this huge issue with the issue with intermarriage. And this is not a, a racial or national thing. It is a religious issue. Um, and remember, it's, the, it's Solomon's marriages that caused the problem in the first place. Because God told Israel, don't, don't adopt their practices, don't, inter, don't intermarry with them. And so it has sometimes been said that it was, um, it, was the, it was the exile that cured Israel of its idolatry. I don't think that's completely accurate. It was the exile plus the leadership and the faithfulness that God, uh, in God's faithfulness that he raised up in the times of Ezra and Nehemiah that put a stop to, to the, the, the trends that caused idolatry to come into Israel in the first place. So the reforms of Ezra and Nehemiah of the society are very important for the Israel's ability to come back and fulfill its mission uh, as a remnant people. Of course, uh, so anyway, those are, those are aspects there. Of course, the rebuilding of the temple is very important, <clears throat> um, and that's emphasized in, the, in Ezra uh, as well. Now, the other thing you see in these books is the idea of the sovereignty of God in protecting his people and fulfilling his purposes. And I like to put Daniel and Esther together here. Daniel is a book of history, obviously, and also a book of prophecy. It's a combined uh, book. Um, and it's interesting, the early part's history, the, mostly the latter part is prophecy. And, um, but I think what you find in Daniel is a, a divine philosophy of history in which God is using all nations, all circumstances to work out uh, everything for his glory and his ultimate plan. And again, remember, we talked about the great um, conundrum that seems to exist, the great, the great uh, difficulty in, in that, again, God in, his, in his, sovereign, God in his mercy has given us this wonderful provision and plan for his plan for the whole world. And yet the, the means he chose to use uh, failed. His instrument failed. It's like the tool broke in his hand uh, as he is, uh, as he is uh, fulfilling this. And so because Israel was unfaithful to the covenant, God sent them into captivity. And now there is no kingship. There's no kingly line. The, the, the line is preserved, but there's no king, right? Um, and except for the very brief period of the Maccabees, there, there wouldn't be a king from the Davidic line. Uh, well, the Maccabees weren't from the Davidic line, but the point is that, that, the, that Israel was under the domination of foreign powers for all that time. They were under the domination of the Babylonians. They were under well, the Assyrians before them, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. And until the time of Christ comes, essentially they're not independent as a nation. There's a brief period of independence under the Maccabees, but, but they're not independent. And so the question is, how can God fulfill his purposes if his divine instrument is not really operating? You know, how is he going to make Israel the, the, the center, as it were, Jerusalem the center of the earth? How is he going to set up his kingdom and, 
How is the house of the Lord going to be, uh, the mountain of the house of the Lord going to be exalted above all the mountains, right? And so one answer to that is this divine um, principle of history that, that we find in Daniel, where God is in complete and absolute control of the forces of history. And that's established in the first part of Daniel. And I, I, think, I think, frankly, the key book to that is actually chapter four, or the key chapters, chapter four, where Nebuchadnezzar, it repeatedly says, the most high rules in the kingdom of men and sets over it whomsoever he will, or sets over it the basis of men, or the heavens rule. It, that, that concept is repeated throughout that chapter. And of course, it's emphasized throughout the whole book. And Nebuchadnezzar comes to realize that God is in charge. And that no matter what he tries, whether he tries to, uh, whether he tries syncretism in his religion and tries to get all the people to worship the, the, the idol, the, the great golden image he set up, and that, that the chapter, chapter three, continually emphasizes the, the phrase, the image which he set up, which he set up, which Nebuchadnezzar set up. So all this is about Nebuchadnezzar's plan, and God totally, totally uh, destroys his plan. And so uh, we have this wonderful principle that the most powerful king in the world has to acknowledge the divine sovereignty. And then that plays out then in the subsequent history when God says, now here's all that's going to happen to the people of Israel. There's going to be this, these, these mighty nations, these mighty empires rise. They're going to be like vicious beasts. They're going to persecute the saints of the Most High. But don't worry, God is going to get the ultimate victory. And, and I think that, and, and it's set in very what we call apocalyptic terms in the sense that, that, that there is this great contest between good and evil and in the end times and God, God wins uh, for his people. So that's, that's in a sense what Daniel's doing. It's a divine philosophy of history showing God's sovereign protection and also of his people and the fulfillment of his purposes. And then Esther as well. Esther is a wonderful book because the name of God is never mentioned, neither is prayer mentioned. Uh, in the book of Esther. Esther says she's going to fast, but it doesn't say actually that she's going to pray. And it's interesting, the one person that is not mentioned in the book is the person who is in control and in fact prom, uh, preeminent in the whole book, and that's the Lord. Everything is done behind the scenes though, right? All of the, all the book, it works out exactly, the timing of it, even the idea of casting lots. And therefore the foundation of the, of the Jewish holiday Purim the casting of lots um, is God working sovereignly in a nation that doesn't acknowledge him and being in absolutely complete control to protect and preserve and exalt even uh, his people. And so again, I think that that's a, there's a strong connection between Daniel and Esther. Daniel is explicit about it. Esther is implicit about it, but I think they're, they're really the same thing. Now, very quickly, what about the post-exilic prophets? Well, um, generally speaking, I can say, and we're talking about here about Haggai, and Zechariah, and Malachi, basically. Um, you have some prophetic material earlier that's sort of at the beginning of the exile, but it tends to be more in the nature of the pre-exilic prophets, similar to their messages. Um, Haggai and Zechariah are both about encouraging the remnant, particularly in the context of rebuilding the temple. And Haggai is more practical and to the point, although he does have uh, prophecy going forward. Zechariah very much has these visions, but the message of both these books is a very encouraging message. There is rebuke for the people in both books, but it's not the same. You don't have the same sense as you do in a, in a book like Hosea, where the judgment is coming, the judgment is coming, the judgment is coming, right? Or a book like Amos particularly. Um, uh, what you have is the sense is that there's hope for Israel's future, that God and his mercy is going to fulfill his purposes. And of course, Zechariah is a wonderful book about, um, about the Messiah, the one that, that was pierced, that they pierced, they're going to mourn for him. And then the wonderful, um, there's a wonderful statement in Zechariah. It says, um, I believe it's in chapter 14, but I'm not sure. It says the bells on the horses, collars, harnesses will say holiness to the Lord. And that's just a beautiful, beautiful picture. Remember, that was what was put on the golden plate on the miter, on the, the headpiece of Aaron, the high priest. So the high priest going before God had this statement, holiness to the Lord, right? 
And what, what Zechariah is saying is even, even bells, as, as, as secular as you can get, even bells on the harness of the horses, horses were unclean animals. Even the bells on the horses' harnesses will say, will say holiness to the Lord, and all the vessels will be holy. And I think what you have there is this picture of God's holiness. The holy of holies is expanded, in a sense, to the whole nation and really to the whole world. And I, I think you, you can draw that forward to the book of Revelation, where you have the, the heavenly city, which is gold as of transparent glass. And it's this massive, massive city. And it's the shape of a cube. And um, if, you take, if, if you take that, as a, if those measurements as indicating a cube. Some have argued that it's a pyramid, but I think it makes more sense as a cube because I think it refers back to the Holy of Holies. And so the whole city is the Holy of Holies. And God dwells with his people. And um, it's just a wonderful, wonderful picture of God's ultimate fulfillment. The whole, the whole city becomes the Garden of Eden. It's a, it's, a, it's a garden, but it's a city. And it's like the fulfillment and, and beyond the fulfillment of what God told Adam to do in terms, of, in terms of, uh, of subduing the earth and in a sense, I guess, making it like the Garden of Eden. So what a, what a wonderful picture that is. And we see that uh, in Zechariah as well, although there is this very strong millennial element in Zechariah, and that's a very strong argument for, uh, for, for an actual millennium where, where God's going to fulfill his promises to Israel. Uh, anyway, there's a lot more to say about that. Malachi uh, is more of a warning book. Uh, it, it, and, and I think what Malachi does, again, Malachi is, uh, is later than Haggai and Zechariah, right? Later by, let's say, 70 years or 80 years. And um, Malachi is warning the people against formalism and improper attitudes and actions in their worship. You notice that Malachi is not rebuking them for idolatry. He's rebuking them for other things. And, and I think what's happening is we've got this, there's a warning here that some of these same problems that, that, that got Israel in trouble in the first place will come up, not so much in the formal idolatry, but in the case of their heart attitude is bad. And, and there's a different tone to Malachi than the former, than the, uh, than the writing prophets before the exile, because there's not so much this emphasis on, on, on the worship here and the worship there. But the fact is they still have a terrible attitude toward the worship. They're offering the lame animals and the blind animals. They're, they're breaking their covenants with their wives. There's, there's a lot of problems in Israel. And I think the idea there is that, listen, you're not out of the woods yet, right? You, you're, not, you're not free of danger yet. Now, very quickly, concluding observations, uh, what can we conclude from all this material that we talked about the last two days uh, the, of class? Well, the kingship, which offered such high hopes, I mean, or for the last, for today, um, this is conclusions for today. Really. The kingship, which offered such high hopes to the end of Samuel failed. Not only did it fail to glorify God and promote faithfulness to the covenant, it was the source to which idolatry was officially introduced into Israel. Even the house of David failed to fulfill its responsibility. And I think if you read Isaiah 7, 1 through 17, you'll see that. The house of David has failed. Not that it ceased to exist, but it failed to fulfill its purpose in history. It wouldn't fail ultimately because the Messiah would come and would give it success. Uh, the prophets failed in calling Israel back to the Lord to avert the exile. Not through their unfaithfulness, but through Israel's stubbornness. After the return, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah had success in motivating the people to rebuild the temple. But Malachi shows that the prophets, um, no more than the law, could the prophets ultimately change the hearts of their original audiences. The prophets failed because the people's hearts weren't changed. Nevertheless, God remains both sovereign and faithful. He was faithful to his word to set the son of David on the throne and bless him. He's faithful to send the prophets to call the people to repentance. He was faithful to the word of his covenant to punish, uh, I should say, punish them uh, severely for their rebellion and to send them into exile. He was faithful to prevent the extinguishing of the line of David. He controlled all nations, both to bring victory and defeat to Israel, to preserve Israel in exile and to affect his purposes, even though Israel failed. He, pr he promised restoration of Israel and the fulfillment of his national and worldwide plan. He promised uh, to be faithful to his promises, to bless and multiply the nation and the house of David, Jeremiah 33. 
And if you want to see the unconditional nature of some of these promises, I think you really need to look at Jeremiah 33. Because he basically says, if I break my covenant with the, with, the, with the sun and the moon, then I will break my covenant with the house of David. And it's, it's this very, very absolute terms. And this is told to Israel when they're on the verge of being carried into exile for their failure. So it's hard to say that this is conditioned upon Israel's obedience. Because they're about to fail, they're failing miserably, and yet he makes this promise in the future. Um, he would do this for the sake of his own name, not for their sake. He, um, he would use, pardon me, several means to accomplish his purposes. The preservation of a believing remnant, the new covenant of regeneration, and the work of the Spirit of God, which I believe are really the same thing. Uh, most importantly, he would send the Messiah would be the divine king, the son of David. He would be the servant that would take away Israel's sin and succeed where Israel failed. It would be Yahweh whom they had pierced. They will look upon me whom they have pierced, as it says, Yahweh speaking. And he will be the messenger of the covenant that will purify the people, Malachi 3, 1 through 4. And with that, we have come to the end of the material. I don't know. I am, I am available and happy to take questions, but maybe the time is gone and we can't. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. It's been very helpful. There have been several comments <clears throat> in the chat regarding uh, several um, uh, key aspects and, and um, overview that you've given that has been extremely helpful, particularly the, um, the, the link between the comparison between the message of Kings and Chronicles. There were several comments on how helpful that was mm -hmm. and the nature and function of um, the covenant in the book of Chronicles. Um, and several comments just like that. So we thank you so much for uh, presenting and all your work that went into these lectures. Um, praise, praise the Lord. It was a real joy and a privilege, and I, I want to thank you for the opportunity, and I pray that the Lord will really uh, bless all of you as you are using everything you're learning in this class and in order to serve the Lord. Thank you, Dr. Shoemate. Thank you. God bless. Okay.